talking about tonight the conversation that we find in Psalm 2. This is session 2. Last week we looked at uh, Psalm 2, and so let's just read through it. It's a short psalm. Psalm 2, beginning in verse 1. It was never more relevant than it is today, than it was in the day when David looked at this and saw it. Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder, and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that have put their trust in him. Wow, we could do several more sessions on this passage, but we're going to do session two tonight of this conversation. There are multiple voices in this conversation. Last week we looked at the first three voices. We like the voice of David. David said, I can't believe I'm seeing this. Verse 1 and 2. And then the voice of the nations. Let us cast off the burden, the bonds, the, the uh, cords that the Lord puts upon us. Which, of course, is the voice of insanity. In verse 3. And then the voice of the Father speaks with authority. He will laugh. He will have them in derision. And then he's going to get real nasty with them. So we'll pick it up there. Last week we talked about responding to panic. People respond in different ways. And in the moment of disaster, if you respond the wrong way, it can be deadly. There are two extremes that people tend to respond. In failure to act, that is just freezing. You know, and I don't know if there's much you can do about that because until you know what to do, that's what you do. But when you hear the gunshot, you need to duck. And the other one is overreacting. You know, don't jump out the window, jump in the closet. You know, or whatever it might be. Don't overreact. And Luke 25, uh, 21, 25 through 28, we read that. And Jesus said basically this. When you see these things begin to happen, uh, you need to respond. So... Let's talk about a couple of headlines that feed into this insanity that we see going on. Yeah. Some headline news. The Senate is about to vote, maybe voting now, I don't know, on the Respect for Marriage Act. And uh, there is no respect for marriage in it. Ultimately, it will be, and, and we've, known, we've known for years this is the way the gay agenda was going to push things. We, we knew that it was. So there's no real surprise. It's still discouraging to see it. They're going to codify gay marriage in such a way that if you don't go along with it, you're going to be going contrary to the government, yeah. the law. Yeah. Now, supposedly, the last thing that I read was that there was an amendment being added that was supposed to uh, exempt... Uh, tax-exempt corporations like churches. 
but I'd also read that it really didn't. That's what it was supposed to do, and it's supposed to placate us, but it doesn't give us that protection. And not only are they going to go after churches, they're going to go after businesses, etc., etc., etc. Well, the Mormon church, this is really kind of funny perspective. So Joseph Smith formed the Mormon church because every single denomination was corrupt. Every Christian church, every Christian denomination was corrupt. And so he formed the Church of Latter-day Saints, and he was going to restore that. So they wanted nothing. In fact, it was said by them that every Christian minister was in cahoots with the devil himself and was a worker of Satan. Okay? Now that's where they were. We want nothing to do with churches. They're corrupt. Every denomination, they're all wrong. Right? That's where Joseph Smith was and most of the history of the, in the Mormon church. Now, probably for the last at least 15 years and maybe closer to 20, they have wanted to become a part of Christianity. They want to be seen as within the church fold, which would make Joseph Smith just roll over in his grave if he knew it. Well, he's got bigger problems than that. <laughs> So it would not surprise me that the Mormon church would come out and say, oh, we're okay. We're all right people because they want to, they want to be accepted so badly. It won't help them. Uh, because it, I mean, how are you going to have gay marriage and it not go against your beliefs? Right? You're going to have to compromise your beliefs for that to happen. So they got that whole problem going on. It's not gonna, they, yeah, they can try to get along if they want to. That doesn't work. Not just for them, for anybody. So the second headline news, uh, this is the headline. Gen Z, so that's the 13 to 24-year-olds, has a religion. They want to impose that religion, and the church is in the way of that. That's the headline. This came from Ken Ham. Some of you will recognize that's a big name. Uh, this is November the 8th in Harbinger's Daily. Harbinger's Daily is a good place to get your news. From the article, Western culture generally prides itself on being open-minded and tolerant. That's what we've heard for decades now, literally. Tolerance for everyone and everything. But do they live up to their own ideals? Not according to a new study out of Great Britain. This study found that Gen Z is less open-minded and more intolerant than older generations. According to the report, a quarter of Gen Z say they have very little tolerance for people with beliefs that they disagree with. They don't believe in unrestrained free speech. In other words, they don't think we should have free speech and say whatever we want. With nearly half agreeing that some people deserve to be canceled. So before we get to that, what this signals is the, the, the college age and up kids, they were all taught tolerance. That's what they were told. That's not really what it was, but they were told, you know, we need to be tolerant of, of whoever, everybody. Everybody's voice is valid, right? But we have now progressed past that to some honesty, and these kids are now saying, you know, we don't need to be that tolerant. We're not tolerant of you and you. We're tolerant of the gays and et cetera, but not, not the church. That's You're the intolerant. That's the area they're playing in. Well, and so I think they're taking it to the next level. They're being honest about it and say, no, no, we tolerate, how do I say it? Exactly. Gay and progressive and all that. They don't tolerate old and conservative and church. Right. And those kids look at the state of the world and so the lens you look through, the worldview that you have matters. 
So they look at how we've done it and we've messed it up and ruined it all. The world's in a mess because of us. Now, you and I look through the lens of the Bible, and so we know why the world's messed up. Go back to Genesis chapter 3 and all that. We understand that. They don't. So their only perspective is, it's time for somebody different to try it. You've screwed it up. Our perspective is always so limited. If you had the perspective of multi-generations, hundreds of years, you would see that God's judgment does come. But from our perspective, where's the promise of his coming? Things continue as they have from the beginning. So there's no fear of God. In Harbinger's Daily, Jonathan Brentner, I just pulled this from him. I could have made my own list, but he put the list together, and it's those things we've talked about for about almost three years. You can go check it out. You can look up Harbinger's Daily and Jonathan Brentner, and you can find these things. He, he wrote a whole article. It's a good article. Uh, so the worldwide food shortages that are coming, they're a real thing. They're going to come. And his point is they're not accidental. They're intentional. The energy shortages, gas, diesel, you know, whatever it might be, uh, at the same time, that dovetails with, well, we've got to get rid of oil and coal. It's, it's killing us. So these things are coming together in a at terrible timing. Record inflation that will get much worse. In fact, you know, people are having a hard time saying the recession word. We're in a recession. Amazon today announced, or it was kind of came out that that they're laying off how many people? Was it 10,000? I think it was 10,000 they're laying off. And so when you see them doing that, those are indicators that recession's right here. Threats of World War III. So three years ago when we talked about this, it wasn't as dire as it is today the real possibility of a World War III is more today than it even was a year ago. We've not only got Russia because of the war in Ukraine, but we've got China who senses weakness, and, and we have all in, we're all in for Ukraine, monetarily, missiles and bullets and all that, to the extent that, that Taiwan can't be protected. And China senses that, and China is, you mark my word, if not by the end of the year, by the early part of next year, they're going after Taiwan. Yeah. And the way they'll do it, just as an aside, this is just my assessment based on uh, some of the intel that I've gotten from people who know things. What China is probably going to do is not fire a bullet. They're going to surround Taiwan with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of boats. Nothing gets in, nothing gets out, until you come home to Mother China. Cover the air with, uh, with planes and helicopters. They could do that, but they, don't even, they, don't even, they won't even need to do that. All they need to stop anything from coming in, air or sea, yeah. don't let it go out. And it's just a matter, and, and that's the old siege mentality, that's how war's always been fought. And and it's, that's the smart way to go as well. And there's not going to be anything we can do about it because Taiwan is hundreds of miles, what, 150 miles off of their shore? Whereas from Hawaii, it is 1,000 miles. I don't know how far it is, something like that. But then there's, there's additionally, there's North Korea going against South Korea that will drag us. So the threat of World War III, at the same time we're having record inflation, at the same time we're having these shortages, at the same time we're having an energy debate, an selling, argument. We're selling our reserves off and even sell them to China. Oh, we're going we're to buy it back. We'll buy it back cheap. <laughs> That's what he said. So the depopulation agenda is factoring into this as well. 
we've talked about this, I'm not going to go into great detail, but these elite globalists really believe that there are too many people on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. There have been people who have calculated it, and they have calculated that there are about the number of people on the earth today as there were at the time of the flood. Another piece of perspective. You could take every man, woman, and child in the United States and put them, give them a three-foot area and put them in Minnesota, I believe it was. We're not overpopulated. That's a myth. And then we've got, we've got many areas that are, that are way less populated than the United States. Anyway, so the depopulation agenda at the same time, we've got the war threat and, and all of these things. They're all coming together at the same time. The push for a one world government. Hey, I totally get it. The individual governments are not working. We need somebody to stand up and take charge. I mean, there's no disagreement about that. We all agree with that. Only thing is, we think his name is Jesus. <laughs> no, we know. <laughs> I think we have a we have a precursor picture, if you will, over when Babylon is destroyed in Revelation. Remember, when Babylon is destroyed, that is the economic system, that is the world system, and when that city of Babylon is destroyed, the people rejoice. They take days off from work and they give gifts to each other. They're gone. I think that's a picture, kind of, of when we're gone. They're going to be overjoyed. And the, the seventh one, we talked about that pretty recently, the mark of the beast for the first time in my life. I think for the first time in the history of the world, since the Tower of Babylon, we can see the mark of the beast. It is the uh, ESG, the social credit score. That is growing. I haven't got time to go into it, but uh, that is growing by leaps and bounds. That's not going backwards. It's going forward. They're going to control you. Uh, couple of headlines. I could have added this as, as one of the headlines today. So the president signed it back in January or February that he wanted the Fed to begin to investigate uh, a Bitcoin that was based on the dollar. Well, that's going forward. Yeah. There was news today about that. Uh, there are a bunch of, um, bunch of companies, bankers, banking organizations that have come together to do that. So all of these things would seem disjointed and it would seem, well, it's a shame all these things are converging at the same time. Well, it's not a shame, it's intentional. Sure. Edward Snowden. I just grabbed this. There was a bunch of other places on the web I could have grabbed something. Here's his twit. twit. He's a twit, but here's his tweet. <laughs> Just in, MasterCard, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, and others launch a 12-week experimental digital dollar pilot with the New York Fed. Now, it's going to be force multiplied by this guy that was in Bitcoin that just, something happened to a whole bunch of billions of dollars. Maybe get most of it to the Democrats. I think that's what happened. Sure. I, I think... Mean, I, mean, I mean, they, they say that clearly, that he donated billions of dollars to the Democrats. And all they had to do was say... Go ahead and do it. We'll make sure you don't go to jail. Uh, so this one's going to be different because it's American. It's going to be based on the dollar. For every dollar of Bitcoin, or every Bitcoin, it's based on an actual dollar. Only there really is no such thing. I say, which doesn't have any <laughs> it is what they say. It's, it's monopoly money, but that's the system that's coming. This just hit the news. A study. Sperm counts decline globally. The source, if you want to go check it out, is uh, news, Newsman Health. I think I spelled that wrong. Here's what this from this article said. We have a serious problem on our hands that, if not mitigated, could threaten mankind's survival. Okay, we hear that kind of stuff periodically, but I think this is a real thing. And Dr. Levine, an Israeli public, uh, is, 
an Israel public health physician and epidemiologist, the study's lead author from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem's Hadassah Braun School of Public Health. The findings were published Tuesday in the journal Human Reproductive Update. Data from 1973 up through 2018 shows sperm counts dropped an average of 1.2% annually. It gets worse. Data after the year 2000 revealed a decline of more than 2.6% per year. This is 2022. Another one of those conspiracy theories. <laughs> Here's what he said. Levine said, it's just unbelievable. I couldn't believe it myself. The professor said the results point to a global crisis that could be compared to climate change. Now, I've got a couple of questions. First of all, how do they actually know this? Yeah, that's a good question. You know? Good question. I mean, maybe, maybe there's ways they know this, but that's a question in my mind. How do they actually know this? I haven't been checked, personally, I can attest. But let's assume that that's true, and I really kind of believe it's true. When he was asked in the article, and I encourage you to go read, find the article and read it, he, he was asked why, you know, what are the reasons for this? And he said that it is the, he said, we probably need to look to the chemicals in our food and water. Absolutely. And he didn't say it, but the genetically modified food is going to be huge in that. Absolutely. Now, so I only know one thing you can do about this. Go have some babies while you can. Right? Aside from that, there's nothing you can do about this. But it does point to this convergence of all these things coming together. It looks like a conspiracy. It looks like a satanic, otherworldly conspiracy. The only thing is, it's not theoretical. It's a real thing. The number of sevens in the book of Revelation are really amazing. Here are some of them. Can you see those? Mm -hmm. okay. These are not accidental. Seven's a big deal to God. I mean, it, when he wrote this book, there's actually going to be, uh, today there are seven lampstands. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's talk about that. Chapter two and three, there are seven churches that Jesus wrote seven letters to. There are seven candlesticks. There are these seven churches. And there are angels of these churches. And you see over here on the right, that this actually makes a mail route. In the old Roman Empire, this was actually a mail route. It begins with Ephesus, number one, Smyrna. So it follows it all, it makes a circuit. Okay, I don't think that's accidental. It, the point God, I think, is making is this is the whole thing. This is a unit. All of these seven churches are, I'll, I'll just jump to the end of it, there are seven different periods of time throughout the church age. You can divide the church age into these seven different divisions. Each one have their own personality, right? So in Ephesus, it was, it was said to them in the letter, you need to return to your first love. Evangelism was beginning to wane in the post-apostolic period. So you go right, and at every one of these, we can look back on history and they fit what Jesus said to these churches. So it's not theoretical. Right. So if we're at the end of the church age, we are entering into Laodicea, right? Yep. I mean, if I'm right about that, we are entering into Laodicea. Well, what's the chief characteristic of Laodicea? It's lukewarm. Yep. Yep. I don't care. And that's the attitude of most Christians. You talk to most Christian preachers. What do you think about the coming of Jesus? Eh, I don't know. I don't really care. 
Laodicea. But we're coming off from Philadelphia. Philadelphia's chief characteristic was it was it was the mission. It was the mission thrusting church. And that's what we saw back in the 50s and the 60s. And it began to wane by the time we get into the 70s. And, and here we are. We've transitioned, I think, maybe fully to Laodicea. But I think also, and, and we need to bear this in mind, any given church can fit any one of these seven in their personality at a given time. So it's not like there's only one interpretation. These are different, different eras, but there's a characteristic. And the reason why we have in the book of Revelation is you need to see what Jesus said to Ephesus. You need to see what he said to Smyrna. There's a message there for the church today. Yeah. So if we're transitioning from Philadelphia to Laodicea, then it matters where you are. And I'm not going to take the time because our time is already gone. But you can read about this in Revelation 3, 7 to 22. It's very insightful. That Laodicean church was different from the church at Philadelphia. The church in Philadelphia, Jesus was right there empowering them for missions. When you come to Laodicea, what do you find? Jesus is on the outside of the church knocking wanting to come in that's a scary thought would you agree with my assessment of the christian churches in america that most of them are not yes absolutely if that's the case then we have transitioned to laodicea so the fourth voice and we'll read these verses we'll have to close with this but we're not done at all the fourth voice was the voice of the Son, the voice of destiny. Verse 7. Okay, so God is going to set his king, his son. I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day I have begotten thee. Well, there's only one begotten Son of God. Amen. Jesus, ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, the utmost parts of the earth for thy possession. For they shall break, for thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Bumper sticker theology, Jesus is coming back and boy is he mad. That's where we are. Yep. Now, if you're on the wrong side of that, this is not an encouraging message. If you're on the right side of that, buckle up. It's going to get fun. So we'll have to close there because our time is gone. We'll pick it up there, not next week, but the next week after that.